Castro. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for logging on for this evening's program. My name is Matt Schumann. I am a programming librarian here at Cary Library. Before we begin, let me know in the chat if there are any technical issues that I can try to assist with. Um, if you have any questions for tonight's speaker, whoops, I accidentally opened an app. If you have any questions for tonight's speaker, please send them via the Q&A. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that this program is made possible by the generous donors to the Cary Library Foundation and in partnership with Somerville, Belmont, Wellesley, Maynard, and Tewksbury Public Libraries, as well as the PBD Institute Library in Danvers and the Public Library of Brookline. With us this evening is Susan Rogers. Susan holds a doctoral degree in experimental psychology from McGill University. Prior to her science career, Susan was a multi-platinum earning record producer, engineer, mixer, and audio technician. She is best known for her work with Prince, 1983 to 1987, but production and engineering credits also include David Byrne, Bare Naked Ladies, Neil Lara, Robin Ford, Tricky, Michael Penn, and Jeff Black, among more, among others. Uh, in 2021, she became the first female recipient of the Music Producers Guild Award for Outstanding Contributions to the United Kingdom of Music. She recently, recently retired from Berklee College of Music, Boston, where she taught psychoacoustics and record, record production uh, in the Department of Music Production and Engineering. Her talk tonight stems from her new book on music listening from W.W. W. Norton and is titled, This is What It Sounds Like, What the Music You Love Says About You. So now, please welcome Susan. Hi, everybody. Hi, <laughs> I'm seeing myself right now, which is always awkward, but we're gonna put an end to that because I'm gonna share the screen. I've got a slideshow presentation. Um, let me just go ahead and get started with that. I'm gonna talk and give you the slideshow presentation talking about um, the subjects that are in the book, which is music listening. And then there'll be plenty of time for questions. And if time permits, I've got some music examples that I can play to illustrate some of these concepts. But I strongly encourage you as I'm talking about these concepts, these dimensions of music listening, to think about your own music. The book that I've written is not about my musical taste. There's some things in there that I love, but that's not the point. The point is to help music lovers get in a richer, deeper contact with the music that they love, to understand their listener profile, as I call it in the book. I have, um, I owe my career, <laughs> and I've had more than one career, I owe them to uh, having a sense, a strong sense of my listener profile, which I'll explain as the, in, in this, in this, uh, presentation. So I hope that this lecture, and if you read the book, the book as well, gives you a stronger sense of your listener profile, why you like what you like, and how the music you love reveals some things about you. So I'm going to share the screen for my slideshow. And here it comes. There it is. Um, the book is called This Is What It Sounds Like, and the subtitle is What the Music You Love Says About You. And they're thinking about um, revisiting that subtitle that the publishers are for the paperback edition because people have asked me, okay, the, these are the songs I like, what does that say about me? And the subtitle, the old subtitle was a little bit of a misnomer. The point was for you tell me what the music you love says about you. I'm giving you the vocabulary for it and, and a way of thinking of it. So I spent a long lifetime working in music. I started in Hollywood in 1978 and being a young woman in the music business in 1978, uh, then as, as now, truly, it's a male dominated profession. And there didn't seem to be much of a chance for me to come up through the ranks and become a recording engineer. The only recording engineers I knew who were female were two women's names that I had read on the back of records, record albums where you'd read the credits. There was Leslie Ann Jones and there was Peggy McCreary, but all the rest of them were all guys' names. But there was one thing I knew I could do that would get me in the door and it would 
be a position where my gender wouldn't matter. And that was being an audio technician, a person who repairs consoles and tape machines. I studied on my own. I studied basic electronics and uh, with a great passion, I was hired by a company that hired me as a trainee. They trained me up and I learned soldering techniques and repairing equipment techniques. From there, I got the break of a lifetime and I am gonna turn to this slide in a moment. I just wanted to give you a little bit more background and establish my credentials, how I know what it is I know. So I went from being an audio technician to going to work for uh, my favorite artist in the entire world at that time in 1983, that was Prince. I had all his records, I'd seen him in concert. He was looking for an audio technician and Prince loved working with women. Uh, he hired a lot of us and gave us careers. Um, he hired me in 83 and he transitioned me from that repairing equipment role to the role of being his engineer. Uh, after I left Prince, I worked for others back in Los Angeles as an engineer. I worked as a mixer, the person who mixes uh, all, the, all the sound sources into a stereo blend. And I also worked as a record producer. Uh, I had a big hit record in 98 with Bare Naked Ladies from Canada. The record was called Stunt and uh, went quintuple platinum. We sold a lot of records. With that money uh, that I made from that, I was able to uh, leave the music business in 2000, enter college as a freshman when I was 44 years old, do eight straight years and get my PhD. So while I was studying and getting my, my PhD and taking classes on music perception and cognition, I learned an awful lot that made me think, wow, I wish I'd known that when I was in the music business. And wow, this explains quite a bit. So when I was invited to write a book about music, well, I said, no, because I'm not a musician. But then my co-author, Ogi Ogas, uh, said, well, what could you write about? And I said, a, a book on music listening. So that's what this book is about. Uh, I discovered in grad school, through the uh, study of music perception and cognition, that there are at least seven dimensions of recorded music any one of which can give our brain a treat, cause a release of dopamine. Four of those dimensions are the musical ones we're familiar with, melody, lyrics, rhythm, and timbre. Timbre is uh, the identity of the sound source. It's what separates a guitar from a piano, from a saxophone. The other three dimensions that can independently give us a treat while listening are aesthetic dimensions. The aesthetic dimensions uh, kick in, or they are analyzed, I should say, when we listen to music, when we look at art, when we um, go to the ballet, they apply to all forms of art and beauty. And those three dimensions, for music anyway, are authenticity, which I'll explain in upcoming slides, realism versus abstraction, and novelty versus familiarity. So if you think of these seven dimensions as independent regions in your brain, over a lifetime of listening, we form preferences. I like to call them sweet spots on each dimension where a given record gives us the greatest pleasure. So that helps to explain why <laughs> Many of us, if not all of us, have a variety of musical styles that we love. You can love Afro-Cuban rhythms, and you can love reggaeton, and you can love uh, rock music, you can love punk music, you can love classical music. Maybe you love all those things, because when you listen to these different styles, you may be getting your treats from different dimensions of the music. So let's go through the seven dimensions one at a time. Let's do the aesthetic dimensions first. The first aesthetic dimension, this is the one that um, came to, what I know about it, I should say, came mostly from the recording studio. The others came mostly from the studying and the science work I've done. But authenticity is something we know about in the recording studio. It's not that well mapped in neuroscience. What we say in the recording studio when we're listening to performances is that sometimes a performance 
it seems to come from above the neck. And other times that performance seems to come from below the neck. What we mean is that a singer might be giving us a performance that sounds like she's singing her heart out. Or a guy might be flirting on a drum kit and he's giving us a performance that's coming from the belly button. Or a guitar player might be playing a guitar solo that is so damn brilliant and so technically perfect, we know it's coming from uh, a place of uh, knowledge and skills that apply to virtuosos above the neck. Now the problem happens when people start out, like we all do, naive, naive listeners, naive uh, music makers. We don't know anything, we don't have any training, but we work our way, if we get music lessons, we work our way toward a, 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 an, an end point called the sentimental. Sentimental doesn't mean maudlin or sappy. Sentimental means you are such a virtuoso, you can express any sentiment and the listener will believe it. Beethoven was sentimental and the goddess uh, Ella Fitzgerald. <laughs> oh, so amazing. Ella Fitzgerald there on the right. Ella Fitzgerald was a, a maestra. She, 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 she was a queen of vocal technique. But the mistake that some musicians will make is thinking that once you've gotten technically perfect on your instrument, you're done. There's nowhere else for you to go. As we know from uh, many of the great artists, including Pablo Picasso and Miles Davis, you're only halfway there. You have to work from the sentimental point all the way back to that naive place of being able to sing or play as if you knew nothing. To be able to perform or make music the way a three-year-old would if he or she could, or the way a 97-year-old would if they could. This is a circle, not a straight line. In the upper left-hand corner is Howlin' Wolf. I love Howlin' Wolf. I love Howlin' Wolf personally, because when I listen to him perform, it sounds to my ear as though those performance gestures are coming from straight from the heart. I love the jazz pianist Bud Powell for that same reason. He can be sloppy as heck, doesn't matter to me. I am listening for deep, sincere authenticity. Now, my co-author, turns out, listens for completely the opposite. He listens for perfection. He listens for above the neck technique that appeals to him more. We all have our own sweet spots. Realism versus abstraction is the next aesthetic dimension. I read a wonderful little book I can't recommend it highly enough. It's called Reductionism in Art and Brain Science, and it's written by the Nobel laureate, Eric Kandel. It's a slender little book, came out in 2016. It's got lots of color pictures in it, including the ones I'm gonna show you. Uh, Eric Kandel wrote about uh, J.M.W. Turner. He was an English painter. In 1803, J.M.W. Turner took his paints and his easels down to the Calais Pier, and he did what painters did in those days. He painted what he saw, a realistic painting, what he was looking at. You see it here. You see the, the sky and the sea and the ships. That's what you did. You captured realism if you were a painter in the early 19th century. But then right around 1840, a guy came along and showed Turner a brand new technology, a little wooden box. And that little wooden box, if you squeezed the bulb, waited long enough and developed what came out of it, gave you a photograph. And Turner, as well as other painters of that era, realized, oh, hell, we're screwed. We're screwed because this new technology can capture reality faster and better than we can. Why would anybody hire us to paint a portrait of the family? The family's got to wear their good clothes. They got to sit there for a week while we paint a perfect, realistic portrait of them, where you can just take a photograph and it's done. But Turner was a little bit smarter than most and he looked at that photograph and he realized, no, 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 no. I'm not finished, I'm free. And in 1842, he went back to that same Calais Pier and he painted what is considered to be the first abstract painting. Turner aimed to 
rather than capture reality, capture what a storm at sea felt like. Capture emotions, capture feelings. And you see the sky and the sea are swirling into each other. Well, I read about this wonderful development in the history of visual art in uh, Eric Kandel's book. And I thought, well, exactly. That's exactly what happened to us in the music business. We were all doing fine, my colleagues and I, in the 1980s and the 1990s. We valued the skills required to capture a realistic recording. And all of us were chasing those great recording engineers who could do that. And then someone came along with not a little wooden box, but a little silicone box. And they said, hey, check this out. It was a laptop with a click of a mouse. All of a sudden, you've got a perfect kick drum. You've got a perfect piano sound. So today, in our world today, we make records that don't necessarily capture what actually happened in a recording studio. It's the idea, the feelings of music, more than the actual performance of it that we tend to value today. We all have a sweet spot on this dimension. Some of us, and I'm, I'm, I'm with these people, like a realistic record. I like hearing real musical instruments because when I listen to music, I like to visualize or picture the performers. Others, and as it happily turned out, one of these others is my, my co-author, Ogi Ogas, Ogi likes abstract records because he really can't stand it when he can actually visualize the performers. When Ogi listens to his favorite music, he likes for his mind to wander. He likes to visualize outer space and science fiction scenes and worlds that don't exist. So new technologies change our art forms and recorded music has been drifting toward greater abstraction with each technological advance. The third and final aesthetic dimension is a fairly familiar one, novelty versus familiarity. When I was in college, I learned about the famous bell curve. Uh, Berlin, 1971, described the bell curve and the bell curve is a normal distribution. It can be IQ or height or weight or algae on a pond, any number of things. But you can take that bell curve and you can think about it in terms of music. So let's say that the x-axis is stimulus complexity, uh, which can be superimposed pretty easily onto familiarity and novelty. So if we look at the x-axis on the far left-hand side, we've got the most familiar music, which tends to be the simplest music, and that would be children's songs, Barney and the dinosaur and the I love you, you love me, the simplest songs, children's songs, uh, about baby shark, do 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 do, baby shark. They tend to be very, very repetitive, simple little melodies because that makes it easy for little ones to memorize them. At the far side of that x-axis, you've got uh, you've got um, the most complex and therefore the most novel music, and that tends to be. Oh, well, the most complex music I know of is freeform jazz because it's deliberately trying to not be predictable, to not have a predictable rhythm, not have a predictable tonality, to be as chaotic as can possibly be, the opposite of children's music. Now, if we look at the y-axis and we consider music consumption, sales or streaming or whatever, you see that uh, the most familiar music, children's music typically doesn't sell a lot, not to adults anyway. And freeform jazz doesn't sell a lot either. The music that sells the most is popular music, pop music, which can be uh, reggaeton in one year, it can be folk music in another year, it can be disco in another year. Anyway, pop music sells the most. And pop music seems to have, for the greatest number of listeners, struck an ideal balance between novel items can be a novel lyric, a novel rhythm, a novel sound design, novel items in the music, and familiar items. It might be a 4-4 four, four time signature. It might be a, a familiar tempo, 100 beats per minute or something like that. Some music listeners have a preference. They like the classic styles of music on the left side of that curve. Classic styles are those where the form is really well known. Rock music is now a classic style. Gospel 
blues, bluegrass. These are classic forms of music. And some people like that because when they choose a new record, they want to hear technical perfection in a familiar form. On the right side of this curve is art music. Art music is music that uh, has a higher dose of novelty in it. It can be very annoying to people who like their music to follow a more standard form. But for those who love innovation and boundary pushing, they're gonna be seeking out music on the right side of the curve. And that curve is always moving forward with time. What was groundbreaking in the 60s and 70s and 80s is uh, very familiar today. So this is constantly drifting. Our appetite for novelty is shaped by our experience with stimuli. If, when you were young, you had some experiences, some listening experiences with boundary pushing music, and if it worked out well for you, you'll probably have an appetite for it today. Now I'll go a bit faster through the four musical dimensions and talk about each one of them. Melodies reflect our speech and our speech reflects our melodies. It turns out uh, that if you play unknown orchestral classical pieces, compositions to listeners and you ask them to guess, do you think the composer was an English speaker, a French speaker, or a German speaker? This is the work of Anirudh Patel. When you ask people that question, they get the right answer at, at, at rates that are far higher than chance. The melodies that we love reflect how people in our culture use their voices, their pitches, their timing, their amplitude to influence our behavior and our feelings. When we're little infants, we learn right away that our caregivers' voices change when they want us to calm down, when they want to amp us up, get us, you know, wake, waking up or something, when they want to warn us, when they want to scold us. That knowledge uh, becomes um, a foundation for allowing melody to express a feeling to us, even if you don't understand the lyrics, or maybe it's sung in a language you don't speak, you can still have a sense of what this is conveying because you're feeling the message in the melody. So humans, and it turns out other species too, send the audio signal that's coming in from our two ears, send it simultaneously to two places in our brains. Nearly everyone's uh, brain, uh, is specialized on the left-hand side for information processing. And on the right-hand side, it's specialized for intonation, pitch and rhythm and music. The left-hand side, for most of us, I say nearly all of us, because there are some left-handed people, a minority, but some left-handed people show this swapped, but the vast majority of us are processing the words of a record on the left-hand side, and the melody and the, the pitches on the right-hand side. Now that left-hand side is the fast processor because when we process speech, we have to understand the difference between rat, cat, hat, bat, sat, and that information happens very quickly. It's in the speech consonants. But the intonation side, the right hemisphere, can take its time and assess the overarching melody of what we're hearing whether it's rising or falling or staccato or legato or just whatever. So when some of your friends say, oh, I never listen to the words of a song, believe them, because it's highly possible that you can listen to a song over and over again and completely ignore that left-hand side or perhaps ignore the melody. Now, lyrics are interesting because lyrics kind of go back and forth often between talking to oneself and talking to someone else, like Whitney Houston's song, I need a man who'll take a chance, don't you wanna dance, back and forth. It almost resembles uh, little infants and their inner speech. Lyrics are important to our self-identity because we tend to like records that are written by artists, or I should say lyrics are written by artists that we relate to or that we uh, agree with. It's called a self 
congruence in psychology circles. So listeners might identify with song lyrics or not. And if you don't identify with it, uh, it's a song that you're likely to reject. When we're listening to lyrics and we hear, hey, you, that's different than if we hear, hey, you, out on the street. If you're out on the street and you hear someone say, hey, you, you turn around and you figure out right away, do they mean you or not? But in a song lyric, for all you know, it can be you. You can pretend that it's you. So lyrics feed our fantasy lives. They let us be the singer. They let us be the one being sung to. They often solve problems for us. This is very important when we're teenagers. Um, when you're a teenager, you're just trying to figure out your place in the world. And you come home from school and you had a bad day. You might uh, put a record on and that singer just might say something that helps you solve that problem. Or they might just comfort you. Or they might give you the attitude that you can take to school the next day. It's no uh, accident that we bond to many musical artists uh, in our teens and we bond very strongly sometimes for life. Rhythm, rhythm is the fastest of our, uh, of these dimensions to process. Um, synchronizing our bodies to rhythm is something that most human beings do spontaneously. So little children will bounce up and down and after their, their bodies are strong enough, they can march and clap in time. It's a human compulsion that we enjoy very much. Not all species can do it. As it turns out, a monkey can't keep time to a beat, but uh, certain vocal learners, very social vocal learners like cockatoos and uh, members of the uh, pinniped family, like, like sea lions and things, can synchronize to a beat. Very social learners, vocal learners. Anyway, moving in sync with a beat is one of the first musical abilities that humans display. We listeners tend to have our preferred tempos and grooves. Most of us like a groove right around 100, 105 beats per minute because our body feels good moving at that rate. The rhythms that you like best are those that suit the way you like to move. When we move together with other people, we display solidarity with them, and that feels good. And last of the musical dimensions is timbre. It's the sound of instruments themselves. Timbre is very strong at conjuring up memories, the sound of someone's voice, the sound of a certain musical instrument, and conjure up a memory. Our timbre templates begin forming in infancy. The timbre template is uh, your basic well, template, your, 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 your standard for how mom's voice sounds, how your brother's voice sounds, how your best friend's sounds, voice sounds. You begin forming those in infancy. So that's why you can recognize those voices if their voices are altered. Maybe they got a cold or something like that and they sound a little bit different, you still recognize them. Humans have evolved to have a very strong preference for vocal timbre. Uh, men have certain preferences for the female voice and women certainly have preferences for the male voice as well. Vocal timbre is very informative. It tells us about the gender, the health, and the emotional state of people. We mentally scan vocal timbres and we're very sensitive to changes in tone. Record makers know that the voice is uh, generally the, the most important instrument on a record. If, that, if the vocal's not strong, if that vocal performance isn't good, uh, you better get back in the vocal booth and do it again because you won't sell records otherwise. Uh, this uh, diagram from the book is showing what happens when we listen. When we're listening to music. Uh, the very first processing that we do is something called auditory scene analysis. What am I listening to? If you're in a cafe, you might hear music and you'd hear noises from the kitchen, you'd hear people talking. You would separate those and attend to whatever you're interested in. Let's say you're interested in music. So this, this combo is playing. And the next thing that happens is you do an analysis of the timbre. What is making those sounds? I hear guitar and voice and saxophone. Now you're gonna split that signal up automatically and independently you can process those lyrics, you can process the melody, you can process the rhythm. The overarching processing that's going on is whether or not it's novel or realistic 
or authentic, we can uh, scan the musical signal in our brains and look for treats wherever we might find them. We don't have to find them in all seven dimensions. Really, all we need is one. This is a wonderful figure to share with you. It is describing uh, the work of um, Carla Kristoff and her colleagues. And they're um, interested in the hot topic right now in neuroscience. The hot topic is the default network. The default network is a network of nuclei, interconnected nuclei in the brain that turns on whenever we go into our own heads. So when Carla asked people, are you thinking about something other than what you're doing right now? 30 to 50% of the time people say yes. That's what a human brain does. It's looking outward and inward, outward and inward. So mind wandering is a spontaneous thought process and it gets activated when we're not focused on an external task or a specific goal. It turns out that listening to music we love is one of the fastest and easiest ways to fire up our default network. When we listen to music we love, we go into our own heads. You see in this little figure here, the x-axis is constraints from weak to strong. And uh, if we go left to right, you see that when you're dreaming, you don't have control over your thoughts. There, there are no constraints there. But when you're awake and your mind is wandering, you can kind of control where your mind goes. And if your mind is drifting and you suddenly get inspired, you think of something like, yeah, I should do that. I should definitely do that. Now the constraints are starting to come in and now we move to creative thinking and now you have a goal and uh, you're no longer engaged in spontaneous thought. Music can get that process happening. This little diagram is just imagining the seven dimensions. The uh, aesthetic dimensions, the three at the top are bi-directional, but melody, lyrics, rhythm, and timbre, they don't exist on one axis. It's more like a, like a, a three-dimensional space. But anyway, uh, the, the, the little hearts represent your sweet spots, let's say, on these dimensions. If a given record comes along, you're listening to it, it doesn't have to match all of your sweet spots. Maybe the melody is very different than something you normally like. Maybe it's, a, it's an abstract record and you like a realistic record. But if that rhythm, let's say, is just perfect, that record is gonna go into your playlist. It's gonna be a record you love. So these dimensions of music influence our reward pathways over a lifetime of listening. A record doesn't have to match all of your sweet spots, just like romantic attraction, record liking is automatic and it's personal to you. Um, I'm wrapping it up here. Um, my book is the one in the center with that groovy, groovy cover, <laughs> our psychedelic camouflage cover. And I can also recommend uh, Of Sound Mind by the wonderful Nina Kraus at Northwestern University, one of the world's, if not the world's foremost expert on music listening and the developing brain adolescence and what music uh, music lessons do for a, for a young mind. And then on the right is Daniel Levitin's huge bestseller, This Is Your Brain on Music. I was fortunate to be a student in Dan's lab when he wrote that book. And uh, it was very, very successful and it's very good. If you feel like joining the record poll, a record poll is where you sit around and you play music for one another, and talk about why you love it so much, you can go to the website, this is what it sounds like.com and join the record poll. Okay, uh, went a little bit long, but now we can have questions. That, that was absolutely fascinating. Uh, I love every dimension of it. Um, I just wanna say for logistics wise, um, Please send all Q and uh, all questions via the Q and A, um, and then we'll address them. Uh, hopefully, we can get to all of them. Um, let's see. Uh, we do have a couple questions that came in so far. Uh, so one is, uh, do you know what parts of the brain are responsible for doing advanced mathematics and piano improvisation? 
Mm. Maybe, maybe they mean is it the same? It might not necessarily be the same. So uh, I, I only know in broad strokes, but abstract reasoning and logical reasoning, uh, as I recall from my studies, um, takes place in the parietal lobe in the back, just above the occipital lobe. The occipital lobe is for vision. So you're imagining the relationships among things in that parietal lobe, which is also responsible for controlling our muscles and how we move through the, through the world, is, is doing quite a bit of that abstract reasoning. But as uh, my, uh, one of my advisors used to always remind us, the whole brain, the whole brain is always processing. And of course, there are regions that are specialized, but it takes the interconnectivity and the communication between all these regions that actually leads to the thoughts that we have. Now, piano improvisation, I know a little bit more about. Um, improvisation, whether it's you're a debater or you're a jazz musician, um, is the skill of, well, in music, they call it composition in real time. So when a person starts a solo, just like when they start debating on a topic, they're gonna to start often with phrases that they've played elsewhere, familiar phrases. You know, they'll, they'll play a phrase or two. If they get inspired and they get caught up in the moment, they will begin to come up with brand new novel phrases. This has been studied in fMRI studies and uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging. Turns out, when you're calling up those phrases from memory, you're activating the hippocampus and memory regions of the brain. But when you start thinking of brand new novel phrases, that's your default net network kicking in. And that's where you go deeper into the brain when you actually start creating. So yeah, playing a solo from memory or sight reading activate slightly different regions of the brain than improvisation and improvisation goes deeper. And that's why improvising musicians will talk about getting into the zone. I'm, I'm, I'm not certain that there's a direct overlap with uh, abstract reasoning and logic other than what's going on with the default network. Interesting. Uh, I'm gonna combine two people's questions because they're kind of just asking the same thing. Um, so. Why are harmony and dynamics not included in your uh, in the dimensions of music? Oh, uh, uh, harmony and, and, and dynamics are talked about. They're talked about in the book, but they're not standalone dimensions necessarily. You wouldn't love a record for its harmony and not love love it for its melody necessarily, because melody and harmony and chord progression are all being processed in basically the same area by the same circuits. The harmony is acting like a shadow or a complementary flavor to the main melody on its own. If it were just the harmony uh, notes on its own, it, it, it would be melody. So <laughs> they're very similar there. And chord progression too is uh, processed similarly to melody. Uh, dynamics, we typically use that word uh, to refer to loudness and softness and loudness and softness changes can definitely be very effective emotively, but it's not necessarily something that would cause you to fall in love with a record. We wouldn't say that um, the reason we love a given record is because of how and when it goes from soft to loud and vice versa. So no, it, it doesn't, the research isn't there to suggest that it's a standalone dimension. But as I said, I, I, I talked about the seven dimensions for which there is empirical research more may be found great um let's see uh what do you think of music for focus or creativity can you recommend any that's an interesting question i remember learning in school that young people can multitask a lot more easily than older people can um it also um our ability to multitask or to listen to music while we are working or creating or thinking of other things also depends on the depth of our engagement with music in addition to our ages. Uh, music ma makers, record makers like myself are trained to pay attention when music is playing. Over 20 years of training taught me that. I absolutely cannot 
focus when music is, is playing. I can't focus on anything other than the music. It's even difficult to drive a car with music playing because I go into my own head so easily. Other people um, are more inclined to do a, a surface processing of music and music is truly a companion for them, just like having someone sitting next to them in the seat in the car. So it depends on the depth of music processing that you do and it also depends on your age. As you get older, you're less like, likely to be able to work well uh, when there's music playing in the background. I think everyone has to find, in, in terms of what music works for you, you'll have to uh, find, find it through trial and error. We're all unique listeners. Hmm. Um, there's a bunch of questions, but one here is, um, I work, someone said they work with youngsters with uh, cochlear implants and they're always searching for simple music as in like fewer instruments and lyrics for auditory training. Do you have any good resources? Oh, the little angels, isn't that the cutest thing? Um, I can't cite anything specific, but I can tell you where to go. Um, in Somerville, there's a wonderful fellow named Jeff Plant and he spells his name G-E-O-F-F, -F, Jeff Plant. And he runs the Hearing Rehabilitation Foundation, the HRF in Somerville, Massachusetts. Um, when I first joined Berkeley, he invited me to come and give some talks there to folks of all ages with cochlear implants. And wow, I learned so much. I learned so much from Jeff, but it's been 10, 12 years since I've been there. I'm actually scheduled to go back in April. He's the man and he will have resources for you on, um, on music that works well with cochlear implants. So the cochlear implants were of course designed for a speech signal. Music is more broadband than speech, low frequencies, mids, highs, constantly changing. So a musical signal can sound really aversive to someone wearing an implant. That's why you need specially designed music for deaf people, specially designed music that allows someone with an implant to follow along with pitch changes. Now, rhythm is fairly easy with a cochlear implant, but, but melody and timbres is much more difficult. Uh, I told our students at Berkeley, because Jeff told me this, if you really want a career, make music for deaf people because uh, the, it sounds funny, but there's, there's, there's an audience uh, that would be tremendously grateful for that. Yeah, they, they mentioned after that Jeff Plant is an amazing friend and professional, mm. all of them. Uh, the, another question is, they freak, this person frequently finds that as they're listening to music, they listen to only one instrument at a time. They can listen to a recording over and over and, and enjoy it as if they're hearing it for the first time. Why is this? I do that sometimes too. Well, I think of it this way. Um, when you put on a record and you decide, oh, I think I'd like to hear some music right now. It's a little bit like taking a dog to the dog park. So the dog is in the house, maybe in the backyard, and dog wants to go out and just wants to run around and be free. So you take the dog to the dog park and you take them off the, the leash and you say, go, be free, have fun, run around. This is your time, this is your place. And some dogs are gonna go socialize with other dogs. And some dogs are gonna hang with people and some are gonna go look for food and some are gonna smell the trash and some are gonna, gonna go over by the bushes and the trees. They're looking for where their treats are. Now, when we listen to a record, we're saying to our brain, go, be free, have fun, have the fantasies that you wanna have, go where you wish. You may, might make a beeline for the lyrics and say, I, I, I think to yourself, your brain is saying, I, I, need, uh, I need a companion, I need an answer to a problem, and you'll focus on those lyrics. Or you might say, oh, just give me that melody, give me that melody, I feel like swooning right now. Or give me that groove, I wanna hear that groove. Or give me that sound design, gotta hear that sound design. Or give me some inspiration, show me something new. Your brain is gonna go looking for the treat that it wants, and that's gonna affect the record that you select at any given moment. Your brain performs that scanning task first time you hear a record. You're hearing a novel record for the first time is scanning and, and listening for, for treats. Where are my treats? If it doesn't find any, you're unlikely to ever want to play that record again. You might say to the person who played it for you, yeah, it's good. 
You'll never play that record again. But if you find a treat, what happens is your brain says, I want that. And you're gonna find out what's the name of that record? Who's the artist? Where can I get this? Because you're gonna want that in your music library so you can enjoy the treat again. Now, you might listen to your record over and over and over again, finding your same treat. And then maybe one day you get bored and you go looking for other treats in this particular record. And you might realize, I never noticed that lyric before. Or, mm. I never noticed that chord change. So that's kind of how it works. Great. And someone said in the comments too that John Coltrane suggested listening to one instrument at a time as well. Um, another question is, are there reasons why people like music that makes them feel strong emotions like sadness or melancholy? And does chord progression often lead to creating these kinds of feelings? That has been studied and it's a good mystery. Why? Do we like sad music? Now, as a quick aside, there are some people who really don't like sad music because it actually makes them feel sad and they don't want to listen to it. But the majority of people do like sad music. There have been some different theories. Some of the popular ones are that sad music allows you to experience sadness without actually being sad or without there being anything to be sad about. And it's a little bit like going to an amusement park you get on a roller coaster and you're spinning around and around and around and around. Why? Why would any human being do that? You hear kids you know, at, the, at the carnival or whatever, and they're screaming their brains out as if they were in mortal danger because it's fun to pretend to get close to danger without mm. actually experiencing it. And sometimes we need a little practice with sadness without actually experiencing it. And a sad song, which lasts three or four minutes, lets you touch that emotion and then realize at the end of that song, yeah, but I'm okay. I'm not sad. I'm okay. One theorist has said, it's like having a companion walk with you to the edge of the cliff, look over it, look down into the abyss, and then having your companion walk you back from that edge. So many people love that. Now, another, uh, another reason is because uh, music is very, very, very effective at awakening autobiographical memories. Often we listen to a record, uh, people will, will remember the people or the places or the events, times in their life that uh, were happening when this record was popular. So a lot of people, in fact, the majority of listeners, according to my own research, actually choose a given record to listen to uh, for those autobiographical memories. Really interesting. Um, there was a couple questions about earworms. Could you talk about those? <laughs> yeah, that's a funny thing. So uh, they say about music that it's kind of a whole brain workout because your forebrain executive thought gets busy with it and your visualizations that accompany music. If you do visualize to music, that'll activate your occipital lobe back there. Of course, your temporal lobes are where you process sound. And then uh, there's your parietal lobe, which is gonna be active with, if you're gonna synchronize your body to the groove. So it's kind of a whole brain workout. Uh, so the reason that an earworm will suddenly get going is uh, brains have a hundred billion neurons, a hundred billion. And now it's inconceivable, but imagine all the possible connections they got going on. Our brain, we got a powerful engine under the hood here. And we're not always giving it enough to do. So sometimes it says to itself, you know what would be good right now? A little bit of music. <laughs> and it'll just call something up. It doesn't have to be a record that you like. Frequently, it isn't. Uh, it'll just call up a little melody or call up a little rhythm or a little bit of a lyric. It's, it's a little bit like chewing gum. It's a fun little thing and your brain will do it automatically. So a study that looked at just how prevalent are earworms, this is back in the 90s, you know, before cell phones were common. They gave these college students beepers and when uh, they beeped you, you had to get back to them right away. And I, I think you used a little device and you had to say whether or not you had a song in your head and uh, what was it? And uh, people had songs in their head like 70 or 80% of the time. It's very, very common. 
sometimes it's annoying, but most people report that they actually kind of like it. Yeah, it's like free radio. Yeah. <laughs> something about uh, information about about the singer and about about the music well susan thank you so much for uh this evening's talk this was really fascinating and i love the examples at the end and hurt is so uh polarizing i feel like but i love both versions and johnny cash is i think hurts more because there's there's maybe not as much time left but yes uh, exactly <laughs> But uh, I just want to say thank you again, and thank you to uh, everyone who attended this evening and all the libraries who helped uh, partner for tonight. Uh, this program was recorded and will be on the Cary Library YouTube channel after uh, tonight. And uh, just thank you again. Thank you all. Thank you so much for coming, and uh, I, I appreciate all of you. Uh, thank you so much, Matt. This was really wonderful. I love the invitation and this was a, a very enjoyable for me. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye.